morning, Central Church. It's a cold day out there, but the sun is shining. It is a warm day in here with the family of faith. It is a good and joyful thing to be together for worship. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to listen for God's voice and to sing God's praise together. May the Holy Spirit fill this time and fill us to overflowing. Welcome to worship. Good morning again. My name is Amber Gaylord and I'll be your liturgist for today. If you're viewing us on television or the internet, thank you for participating in that way. May we all feel the embrace of God's spirit as we share this time together. If you are a guest here in our sanctuary, we're very glad that you're here today. If you'd like to learn more about Central, there are information packets available at either entrance. Please pick one of those up on your way out. And just a couple of announcements that I'd like to highlight. First, <coughs> excuse me, if you're sitting in the aisle, please sign and pass the maroon colored friendship pad so that way you know who you're worshiping with today if you don't already. Today, we are doing our week here Sunday, but we're doing it a little bit different today. Instead, of, we do have the labels available. There's five left. Everybody at 830 had a blast with this. So we need five more cards to be done for our homebound members, and we are doing making your own Valentines for the homebound. You can even make one for a family member or a friend too, if you would like, to cheer up somebody's day. If you wanted to take a card, you can do so on your own with, you just need scissors and glue to put it together. Or if you feel crafty after the service, there are all supplies available in the Welcome Center for you to make a Valentine. So we'd appreciate if we could get those last five. On Saturday, February 22nd, the Fellowship Committee is hosting a wintertime game night like we normally do our ice cream social and game night in the summer. We're having one in the winter. And we are still gonna have ice cream, but we're also going to be adding popcorn and hot chocolate. So come out, have some fun, bring a game, bring a friend. It'll be a good time. We get together and play four or five, six games. So, we, so we'd love to have you come along. Our Shrove Tuesday Pancake Supper is Tuesday, February 25th. So please mark that in your calendar. Um, adults are $6, children $3, and tickets can be purchased at the door. Super Bowl Sunday last week, we did collect 136 cans of soup and eight boxes for chow, a total of 156 pounds. So we do thank you for your donations to that. Now please know anyone is welcome at any activity, any time here in Central. If you'd like more information, please contact the church office. Please remain seated and join in our responsive call to worship, printed in our bulletin and displayed on the screens. God is waiting with tender heart and deep questions. God is blessing us with springs of living water. Let the conversation begin. Let us pray together. Get up home.
Please remember, if you prefer not to shake hands, let us turn to greet one another in Christian love. Me and Victoria are going to be best friends today. So I, I had a question for everybody, but now I guess you're stuck with it all by yourself. So we'll make it for the grown-ups too, shall we? Okay. So if someone told you they needed you to do something important in the world, what would your first reaction be? I'm asking all of you too, so that she doesn't stick up here all by herself. What would your first reaction be? I need you to do something really super important in the world. <laughs> you want to know what, don't you? Before you say yes or no, right? Right? Whole bunch of skeptics in this room. No trust at all. You'd want to know what? Why would you want to know? Why would you want to know what it is? Because I might be asking you to do something that you've never done before. I might be asking you to leave where you used to be. I might be asking what? The unknown is hard. What else did I hear? Yeah. Commitment. Oh, I don't, you don't know if I'm asking you to do something for five minutes or for five years, do you? There was a danger. There. Danger. Yeah, right? I could be asking you to do something dangerous and you wouldn't even know, would you? It's a little suspicious, isn't it? Somebody asks you to do something big for the world. Well, guess what? Jesus does that all the time. And he doesn't always tell us what. He, you know, we can say what all we want, but sometimes Jesus says, no, I have something important for you to do, and I just need you to trust me and do it. Now, if I put Jesus into the equation, what's your answer? What do you want us to do? <laughs> what do you want us to do? <laughs> we do. We get, we get all hesitant about doing big things or important things or things we don't know. But that's what Jesus asks us to do all the time, to trust him and to say, if you're asking me to do it, it must be for a good reason. It must be something important. Even if I can't see it, even if I'm afraid of it, even if I think I can't do it, even if I don't want to do it, it must be important if Jesus is asking me to do it. You think you can, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. It makes sense to me. Jesus asked me to do things all the time that uh, <clears throat> I'm not necessarily comfortable with or happy with all the time. Um, do you know I hate, I hate speaking in public. <laughs> I do, I do. But you know, Jesus asked me to do it every single Sunday twice. And I do because I trust him to make something out of that. And so Jesus takes what we're afraid of or what we don't like doing or or things we're uncomfortable about, or things that feel risky to us, and somehow turns them around into something important. It's scary, isn't it? I think so, too. Why don't we have a prayer? Because I'm done being scared. All right? Shall we do that? Will you all pray with me? Repeat after me. Gracious God, we thank you for brave Victoria. <laughs> We thank you for bravery in our own hearts because sometimes you ask us to do things. Important things, risky things, uncomfortable things. And so we trust you to make it all right. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You are brave. <laughs>
The first scripture reading comes to us from the Old Testament, Psalm 112, and can be found in your pew Bible on page 563. Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in God's commandments. Their descendants will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses, and their righteousness endures forever. They rise in the darkness as a light for the upright. They are gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. For the righteous will never be moved. They will be remembered forever. They are not afraid of evil tidings, their hearts are firm, secure in the Lord. Their hearts are steady, they will not be afraid. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have distributed freely, they have given to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn is exalted in honor. The wicked see it and are angry. They gnash their teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked comes to nothing. We have come now to our time of offering. Our offerings each week empower ministries within our congregation, in our community, and beyond our local church. Please note, if you are visiting with us today, do not feel obligated to place anything in the offering plate. You are our guest, and your presence here is a gift. Will the ushers please come forward?
pray. O oh God, there are many things we do not understand. We do not understand the emptiness of accumulation, nor our desire to acquire more. Our desire to live this year more fully, faithfully, is even a mystery, but it is real. Our gifts today are symbols of our hope and inner yearnings. Receive them and transform them by the mysterious power of your love. Amen. be seated. We have come now to a time of joys and prayer concerns. Prayer concerns can be found in the back of your threefold bulletin each week. This week in our prayer program, which is specific families in the congregation that we pray for once a year, Jane Allen, Amber Brown, Nancy and Chuck Santa Croce, Amber and Eric Gaylord, Shelley LeBevereau, Mary O'Brien, and Cynthia Scordino. Church family and friends requesting specific prayers this week, Phyllis Beach, Jean Rosnack, Norma and Mel Livingston, and Paul Washington. green light is now on. Yes. It, it got, it froze up. My pack froze up. Sometimes that happens. Oh, mercy. <laughs> so as we come into a time of prayer, um, this week, I'm wondering where you have seen God at work in your world this week, in your life. Come here. Oh, wonderful. So this is, Dave, this is your aunt or great aunt? Aunt. So David's aunt turned 100 and is one of those uh, fortunate individuals who's living life large uh, in her own home and enjoying it. And so, huh? She and she likes to eat. So, 
So uh, they are celebrating just this joyful life and uh, the celebration of her birthday and the family gather. I imagine all the family was there. So what a wonderful, what a joy. Two of our um, faithful, faithful, wonderful church members um, passed, and we had celebrations of life and witnesses to the resurrection in their services um, this week. Chuck Loudon's service was on Tuesday, and Alta Holly's was on Thursday, and um, we sent both of them off with love and care and just the joy and fellowship of this place, and lots of singing, <laughs> lots of music. It truly seemed like a celebration. Yeah, so... So Deb sees God in that too. Yeah. Where else have you seen? Oh, hands in the choir. Well, I know some don't attack me too, but when it was snowing, <laughs> when we got this snow, there was just something about the way that snow was falling. I was watching it out my front window, and I just felt really close to God at that point. And maybe it has to do with the song that we sang. Maybe. Libby's talking about... Um, uh, just watching the snowfall and feeling at peace with God in that peaceful um, weather moment. <laughs> and maybe it had to do, she says maybe it had to do with the song they sang today, but the, the peace of that beauty. Bonnie. Well, the grandson got in the class, back this week, and two women just married. Oh, my goodness. So Bonnie is celebrating, um, wow, celebrating 14-year-old gra grandson grandson had a biopsy on a tumor, um, which came back as benign this week. So they are celebrating that good news. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> um, just so very thankful for my mom um, and the faith that she had and she gave me. Maggie is Thankful and grateful for the faith Alta had and passed on to her and to your whole family. Um, incredibly strong, strong faith. Was there any more up here? I'm grateful for your continued prayers for my family. Um, my dad will have a chemo port put in on Friday, and they will begin chemo and radiation forthwith. So uh, I don't know any more than that, actually which is driving me a little mad. Um, but that's where we are. So I, I'm grateful for your prayers and for your care. Are there others? Shall we pray together? Holy and living God, February is hard. With snow and ice and still short days, with cold in the air, we are yearning for spring. Moving our way forward toward it, knowing that it's coming, knowing that it's around the corner. We know it's a metaphor for our own lives as well, for those times of sorrow and struggle, for the times of stress and pressure, for the times we are stuck doing what we do not want to do in places where we do not want to be. Our hope is for spring, for the power and the promise of renewal and restoration, for the power and potential of growth and new life. That is your promise for us in all things. Through all our struggles, through all our sorrows, through all our trials, your promise is that spring will come. Resurrection will happen. Renewal 
is your plan. It's a holy one. We rest in that assurance. We trust in your promise. Help us when we lose sight of it to lean into it even more closely, even more intentionally. Help us to remember in the deepest, darkest days of our lives that you are present, that your power can redeem all situations, that your presence can hold us up and support us when we need comfort and care. And Holy One, for those in this place and this time whose hearts are full of springtime already, we give you thanks. Help each one be bearers of that freshness and newness to the world around them. Help us to partake in grace by association. with those who are powerfully feeling it now. Your care and your love for us all overwhelms us. Help us always to live into it. Help us always to be that care for others. As we have already begun that work, with those we've named this morning, those in need of prayer, those in need of contact. So we continue as we bring the deepest cares of our own hearts to you, friends and family members and and those we keep close who need something, who need hope, who need healing, who need a glimpse of springtime. Hear us as we bring each one to you, as we lift their names by speaking them aloud. We bring each of these names to you in trust and in hope. We bring each name to you knowing that you already care. Lord, in your love, hear our prayers. For we ask each one in the name of Jesus the Christ, as we offer to you now the prayer he first taught us to pray. Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 13 through 20. And this is taken from the message. Let me tell you why you are here. You are here to be a salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. If you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God 
this generous God in heaven. Don't suppose for a minute that I have to come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together, put it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky and the ground at your feet. Long after stars burn out and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Trivialize even the smallest item in God's law, and you will only have trivial, trivialized yourself. But take it seriously. Show the way for others, and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom. Have you ever wondered why you're here? I don't mean here on a Sunday morning, sitting in that pew. I mean here. I think every person on the planet has had some of that existential angst every now and then. Why am I here? Am I making a difference? Does it even matter that I'm here? What am I supposed to do now that I am here? I love this part of the Sermon on the Mount, the end part. Jesus gives us in this the whole reason for being, the whole meaning of life, a summary of all the commandments, all the law, all the rules about religion and all the doctrines we've created to dress up our faith, the entire answer to what does God want me to do with my life question. Basically, the answer Jesus gives is this, be salt, be light. That's it. It's a simple answer. But boy, we're not very good when somebody gives us a simple answer. We do all sorts of dressing up what Jesus says. We put all sorts of rules and regulations around Jesus and around following him. We look everywhere for some hidden truth in his teachings. Do you have any idea how many Bible studies out there um, have somewhere in the title something about the hidden truth of, right? You've seen them. The hidden message in Revelation, the hidden truth in John's gospel. We look everywhere for something more complicated, or we work very hard at making it more complicated. But the essence is right here in the Sermon on the Mount. Be salt, be light. Jesus isn't asking for us to be something complicated or to be more than we're capable of being. Jesus is not pulling out extreme or extraordinary examples or expectations here. Salt and light are simple things, ordinary things. This is who God created us to be. But, see, with Jesus, there usually is a but. But, as simple as that is, we are not meant to keep that essence. We're not meant to keep the essence of who we are and whose we are entirely to ourselves. We'd like to. <laughs> Do you remember last Sunday when I called Jesus a troublemaker? Well, this is exhibit B in that case. Jesus, though, moves on very quickly in this whole Sermon on the Mount from troublemaking straight into meddling in this part particularly. You remember Bishop Morrison? Anybody? Bishop Morrison ordained me once upon a time. She used to joke when she was preaching a particularly prophetic sermon, read that to mean troublemaking sermon. She used to joke as she was winding up that she was moving into preaching and meddling, preaching into meddling, so we'd better watch out. Jesus is meddling here. He's done all this beautiful stuff in the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you, blessed are you, bless, you know, blessings for you, blessings for you, blessings for everybody, blessing, blessing, blessing. And he's moved into this part 
and he starts to meddle. He's meddling with our desire to keep ourselves to ourselves. He's stepping in and calling us out about the way we tend very often to hoard our life and our blessings. He's challenging everyone who hears him on that hill that day, but also everyone who hears him in all the ages since and all the ages to come. He's challenging all of us who just want not to be bothered or who really would prefer not to concern ourselves with serving other people. He's challenging everyone who just doesn't want to rock the boat. He's saying, yes, be salt, but season the world around you. Keep it from spoiling. Be light, but shine for the world to see. Shine into all the shadows. Shine love. Shine hope. Shine peace. Shine reconciliation. Shine grace. Shine life. And sometimes that's hard. Even being ordinary people sometimes takes courage when we're in the middle of extraordinary situations. Putting ourselves into the world around us because God has called us to be precisely ourselves and nothing more and nothing less in that situation, well, that sometimes makes people uncomfortable. Seasoning the world, shining a light when nobody else is, can be uncomfortable. Sometimes it feels like there is just way too much attention that comes to us as a result of that. Sometimes it feels like we put a target on our forehead when we do it. Now, I'm about to do something that I never, ever, 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 ever thought I would do. When I told Nate, he said, really? <laughs> so, Left-leaning and right-leaning and center-leaning folk, brace yourselves. I'm about to mention Mitt Romney in a sermon. <laughs> I know, right? But my friends, that man was having a salty moment this week. A light on a hillside moment this week. Did you see it? The moment where a career politician stood up in front of the world, on camera, and in a hot vicious news cycle against those he's closest to and defended a surprising and extraordinary course of action by saying, I'm doing this because I took an oath before God. And this is who I am as a man of faith. Now, this was not the use of God's name for political purposes. It was not the use of God's name as a hook to catch potential voters. Romney put a target on himself with this statement. And that, my friends, is salt and light living. No matter your political leaning, no matter what you believe about him or his personality or his voting record or his party affiliation or any, any of that, that's all incidental. That was salt living. That was light living. And this is why we're here. Ordinary people doing ordinary things on ordinary days. Even we have deep and sublime purpose. To speak the word of life and light. To stand witness to our place in this world as God's people who claim Jesus' name. We are here to make a difference. But we have to stop measuring that in human terms. the difference we're able to make is because we are God's. It's because we treasure the life in God more dearly than we hold anything else. It's because we've been so filled with God's grace that we can't help but overflow into the people and the places and the situations around us. And that means accepting that God counts even the small stuff. The stuff we discount because we think it doesn't rank very high on the cosmic judgment scale because it's just not spectacular. 
Being light in the gloom means often something as simple as calling someone you've lost touch with or, you know, making a, a funny valentine for a homebound member of the church or helping out a complete stranger. Being salt can be as specific as taking the first step at reconciliation with someone you've been at odds with for a while. Or it can be as general as a donation to a fund you care about, or a prayer, or a mission trip, or a statement of faith in a trying time. You know, salt isn't the same in every context, is it? Depends on where you're using it. Salt can make bland things bright. It can make sweet things sweeter. I never will forget the day my mother explained why you put salt in cookies. Salt preserves, it heals, it restores. We don't all have to do the same things to be the people God has created us to be. We don't all have to do something as spectacular or as risky or as dangerous as Mr. Romney did this week. I'm pretty sure I won't have to stand in front of a microphone claiming my identity as a faithful follower of Christ. Oh, wait. <laughs> do that every week. <laughs> doesn't have to be spectacular. That's the fulfillment of the law and prophets that Jesus is talking about. That's the fulfillment of purpose we keep searching for, this salt and life, salt and light life. It's the why of the why are you here question. We can spend all the time we want talking around it, we can spend all the time we like deciding that it's too uncomfortable or too impractical to live that way. And we often do. <laughs> or we can undervalue ourselves, sell ourselves short, convince ourselves that we don't have anything to offer. But Jesus, meddling Jesus, again, says that we do. He makes it very clear. Here on the mountain, in this time of teaching, and in other times and other places too, he makes it very clear. He has given us the light to bear into the world in mostly ordinary ways. He has showed us where the world needs our flavor, and he set us to seasoning it in our own particular way. It just won't do to say that we can't or that we won't. It does create one huge question for each one who has ears to hear him, though. What saltiness are we called to get up to this week? This year, tomorrow, the next hour? Where will we stand and let our light shine? If we're paying attention to him, we'll figure it out. We will see why we are here. Thanks to, be to God for that promise. Amen. Now, speaking of risky, we're going to sing a brand new song for most of us. In the green songbook, 3109. Sean's going to play that through a little bit. Um, oh, he's going to play through the whole thing. Um, what, what we noticed the first service is that um, our little songbook has more rests at the end of the stanza than Sean has. So just go with it. Should we stand as we're able to?
pretty? That's lovely, isn't it? As you go into this week and into this world, there is only one blessing and dismissal possible. Go and be salt. Go and be light. And may the Christ who calls you to do that go with you as you do. Amen.